My name is Laura Lee Stanlake. I'm the Director of Women's Ministries with First Stone Ministries, where I have served since 1993. Um, First Stone Ministries is a ministry and outreach to the sexually and relationally broken, primarily in the church. Uh, the people that we deal with are primarily referred through churches, through Christian organizations. And the people that we minister to deal with a wide variety of issues from just normal, um, normal questions and concerns about their, their, their sexual thoughts or concerns that they might have about their attractions to people who are dealing with really uh, significant struggles with sexuality, um, sexual identity. And we deal a lot with the topic of abuse. We deal a lot with uh, family and marital issues. We deal a lot with just um, people just trying to sort through this, but a, a major, in the midst of all that, we do a lot of one-on-one -on -one biblical counseling. We have support groups that work within all of those populations. Uh, and then we have a significant outreach for parents who, who themselves have a conflict with the sexual choices that their kids are making. And that group itself is very, um, very vibrant, very meaningful. And it's one of the longest ministries that we've had uh, going uh, since 1976. Uh, First Stone Ministries was founded by a pastor and his wife whose son was living a gay life in San Francisco. And this pastor and his wife didn't have a place to go. They didn't have a support system for themselves. And so they, they originally formed our ministry uh, and just trying to pull in other pastoral families who are dealing with these significant issues to bring encouragement to one another and um, to fortify themselves for that struggle. And then in the midst of those days, um, hus husbands and wives, moms and dads started bringing their struggling young people to the meetings as well. And, and First Stone became a ministry to the sexually and relationally broken. And I'm happy to serve there. Our executive director, Stephen Black, um, is, a, is a faithful cultural warrior. He really stands strongly uh, on, on the word of God, he's contending for the erosion that is happening in the church regarding LGBTQ issues. Uh, the church herself often is being tempted to believe that God does not transform, will not transform, that he exerts no power to set men and women free, particularly in the issues of sexuality. So I'm really grateful to serve under Stephen. And today you'll meet two more of our staff members, Laura Beth Perry, uh, who came on with us in November. Um, she is, she would hesitate to call herself a transgender specialist, but what she is, is a woman who, who lived a transgendered life and the Lord called her out and set her free. And you'll also meet Joseph Thiessen, who is working on, uh, as our staff administrator. He's our office administrator, uh, an amazing, bright um, servant of God who can do almost anything and we would really collapse without him. But he, he himself carries a testimony of God working to set him free from not just pornography, but also in an identity that is really unique. He actually falls into the category. He himself carries a genetic issue, and he'll testify to that today and how the Lord is meeting him. Uh, my primary job is to help you um, get a picture um, in the middle of all of our cu cultural com conversations. I want you to get a picture of the fact that underneath all of these identities that we throw at one another, that all those terms that we assign to ourselves that for, for most cases, we will find that there are things that have happened, things that have contributed to the formation of sexual confusion, um, of broken sexual identity. And I use that word understanding that for many, that word broken would be offensive. 
but because my view is that what is broken, Jesus heals, because my view is that what what is not walking in accordance with the truth of God's word is something that God himself is ready to deliver men and men and women in or from. And um, because I carry those hopes in me, I will use the word sexual brokenness and relational brokenness to explain. Um, let me begin with this and just talk a little bit about why there is cultural confusion. Um, I think I want to begin by defining terms and I don't want to get really bogged down in this because my goal is not to make you experts, but I, I actually just want to see you be able to be firm and steadfast when you sit across from men and women who are dealing with these struggles. I want you to prayerfully believe God, that God may have a plan for them that exceeds their best, their best choice for themselves that God may have a plan. So I want you to understand why the conversation's hard and why we're struggling so much. So I want to begin, and you'll see in your notes, I want to begin with some terms. The word gender, for many of us, we would look at gender and we'll say, well, that means to be a boy or a girl. And that is true. Gender refers to biologic sex characteristics, either male or female. But the current social definitions have changed gender, the word gender, to the word sex. So you would have a biologic sex assigned to you and gender becomes something else. So it's important that you know that it's what it might seem obvious that it's a boy or a girl, what gender, a gender reveal party, right? Um, that, that that in itself what is where the debate is. The second term is gender identity, and you'll see that in your notes. Gender identity is a person's perception of themselves in their gender, which may or may not agree with their biologic sex. And then there's gender dysphoria, and this is a, this is a tough, uh, ever-changing term as well. It is a clinical definition for someone who's in distress because their biologic sex and their gender identity do not agree. So it creates a conflict, a crisis for them, and that's gender dysphoria. Transgender is a term to capture all expressions of gender that do not conform to the cultural norm. That followed, um, that means biologic sex or cultural expressions of gender a transgender person would redefine that or view it differently in the process. Why is that significant? Well, um, that's the nature of our conversation. And in a moment, you'll see that there are many different ways that people brand themselves in this cultural conversation, that people have many different ways to describe their sexuality or their perception of themselves. And that is also true within the transgender community. Um, I know that many of you are seeing that in, in, in your clinical practice, you're seeing that coming into your office, you're seeing that expression, um, women living as men, men living as women, and many other expressions as well. The word intersex uh, is a medical definition. Intersex is a sex variation, including chromosomes, the gonads or genitals that do not allow an individual to be distinctively identified as male or female. And I remind you, you'll hear a testimony shortly about that. And then in the broad cultural conversation, we're talking about LGBTQ plus. Um, it's everybody who falls under that flag, that six, that six banner flag. Um, it represents lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, or questioning, and it's meant to represent a wide diversity in a community. And that would include several more letters, more than are depicted there. Um, LGBTQ is a brand. It's a way, a recognizable way to talk about divergent communities. It's recognizable and it brings some definition to this group of people. Inside of that brand, there are more, and I, I'm not even defining all this for you, but in addition to 
lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, transsexual, queer, questioning, intersex. There's also asexual, allies, pansexual, agender, gender queer, bigender, gender variant, pangender, and a host of other expressions. Um, there's no way we could unpack it all, but even Facebook gave up at some point. It used to keep adding these variants uh, as the possibilities of what you could choose for gender. And finally, um, I discovered last year, it says male, female, or custom. And underneath you could put what your identification is and then define what pronoun, he, she, they, them, how you would like to be addressed. Um, I think that those are the sources. All of that conversation is how the confusion comes into the heart of so many. Um, by endlessly defining and fragmenting our conversation, we're, while we're looking for uniqueness, while we're looking for uh, unique expressions for ourselves, we're, we're wanting to be creative, we're not wanting to be put in a box. And I'm in favor of not putting people in a box. Um, but at the same time, what it does, it also creates dissension. It creates confusion. It makes it impossible to have a conversation about the same thing together. And uh, for me, as a minister in this area, and really for us as a staff, what I would say is um, this is where we really have to ask the Lord to go before us, that uh, you don't want to start a conversation with assumptions about people or why it is the way it is for them, or even to quickly judge it. But what you want is for God to break in and bring truth to people. And uh, it takes that. You can't argue deception out of a person. You can't. You have, to, you have to ask the Lord to open that place in their hearts. All those conversations will complicate our work. And I'm speaking to you knowing what you all do. You're already people who are on the front line of a culture battle. And because the other agencies, the ones who are not trying to save lives, the ones who are not trying to bring the gospel, the ones who are not trying to bring help to people in this way, because they're providing services to help people define and redefine and redefine sexuality, um, providing hormones, providing things for people who are trying to transition, um, hoping to become a different gender. It's difficult for us. It makes already difficult human interaction, already difficult um, ministry uh, goals even more difficult. It creates room for offense. It trades objective truths for more subjective ones. And in that place, then, it becomes my truth and your truth. And it isn't, it isn't any longer what is the truth or can this truth make a difference. We can't, if we can't agree, um, we, there is no help. So it's important to know who you are. And I, I don't want to preach to the choir, really, but as you stand in that bold contrast that I just said uh, is true about you, that bold contrast for the lives of the unborn, for thriving mothers, for healthy outcomes and healthy families, and most importantly, for the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the hope of the world. Those, those reasons that you're in the work are varied. Those reasons that you have compassion are varied. The reasons it's important to you are varied, but there we are. And so you hold a standard for the image of the creator. You're holding it out for the lives of the unborn and for their moms and dads. You look for opportunities, not only for sacrificial and compassionate service, but for offering Jesus Christ to the ones you're serving. And I love that you're that sacrificial. And I want to remind you, it says in Galatians 6, let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. And why that matters is we need to, we actually, in having this conversation about gender and sexuality and sexual brokenness and relational brokenness, we need to do a quick inventory on what makes us weary. 
if we can identify what it is that makes us weary and doing good, I believe that's where the Lord breaks in his, his word, his truth, his spirit breaks in to, to instruct our hearts and to refresh us, to let truth scatter the deception that wants to overtake us all. I mean, if we needed a better, a better example, a, a perfect illustration right now for us is all of the discussion about the COVID. How many different views do we have and how many different ways of adjusting ourselves can we be expected to handle? If anybody were to ask me what makes me weary, it's like, I don't know what to believe. You know, I could support statistically almost every view. But in fact, if I do an inventory on why I've become weary, I can come up with some really significant things. I'm, I'm weary of the conversation, the clamor, and I'm, I, I, I'm tired of being afraid. I'm tired of being pinned down and not be able to get stuff done. I, I am. But when God breaks in, he, scatter, he scatters the fear. He, he breaks the power of the evil one, and he sets us into a, a, a beautiful and spacious place. I like, I like Isaiah 35, that wherever the deliverer comes to deliver, the, the highway is, is made wide for us and safe, and there's no devouring beasts on it. It's for people who walk in the Lord's way, and then they come out with everlasting joy upon their heads, and sorrow and sighing flees away. For me, that fear factor is that fear of being overwhelmed or inadequate for the onslaught of human need. And so you're already, you're already in a place where you're having to deal with, you know, life. You're actually talking about, you know, how do you save lives and how do you save souls? And if that battle weren't enough, in comes, in comes all of this variation about sex and sexuality, and it produces intimidation, doesn't it? And confusion, uh, it, it produces uh, the temptation to not believe what God says. Sometimes we get pushed off our game and we're pushed into things like, um, you know, pushed into things like, let me throw a verse at you. <laughs> you know, let me throw a verse at you and that, that'll that correct everything. But in fact, the real life for us is when we really stay centered in what we know is true from the Lord, what we really know. And then from that place, we intercede and um, ask the Lord to move in those situations. You know, I, I assume that most of you go into the day praying well for what you will encounter in the day, praying that God would break in and save lives and uh, make a way for his gospel. Um, so there, there's my little encouragement for you. Um, I, so I want to talk a little bit about those, those underworkings that I mentioned a while ago, the, 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 the reality of um, the, the reality that uh, if, if I believe, if I believe that God created us male and female, and I do, uh, Genesis 1, 2, and 3 um, really inform my worldview that God set, set, conceived of and set into motion um, a plan for human interaction and a plan for fruitfulness. And uh, that fruitfulness it uh, takes a lot of different faces, but obviously it was talking about fruitfulness and childbearing. Obviously it was talking about um, an identity that was centered in the fact that, hey, we're, we are image bearers. We're people created in the image of God, that, that we were made in his own likeness, male and female, he created us. So from that from that point of view, from that worldview, and I, uh, you'll see at the end of my notes for you just uh, lots of scripture, okay? And I, I, you know, be brave if you, if you're in a day of just looking up verses, or if you're a really Bible study mode person, which I am, 
you know, I think, um, I think it'll encourage you to know that the Bible doesn't just speak to it once or twice, but actually he speaks to the issue of human sexuality over and over and over again. That is part of the gospel redemption to put away broken sexuality and actually be filled with, with God, be filled with Christ. Um, so let's just talk about some of those causalities, those, um, those undergirdings. Um, the first that I, I want to speak about is, um, you know, we have, we, we're, we're born and as we begin to develop, we develop, um, perceptions on our world. We are, as we, as we mature a little, we begin to bring into play, um, personality preferences, those of you who have kids, you know, this kid likes, this kid likes weenies and this kid likes Brussels sprouts and they don't understand why the other one does. That's just preferences. This is, this is just how it is. Um, you know, my little sister was a screamer and, um, you know, I was a really kind of a contained, quiet one. Uh, you know, the personalities become real and defined. Um, I, I live and work in a community of people who are really, really very unique from one another. You know, the, those differences between the person who likes office supplies as their favorite toy, um, which is me, or, um, or some people who are just endlessly um, creative, people who are always making something out of nothing. Um, you know, I, I just, I, I think that we often too quickly dismiss the role of personality and temperament and how God makes us different. And so when, when people step out into the world and they try to figure out where they fit in the world, a lot of times they're looking for someone just like them. I want to find other people who are just like me. This is very, very normal. And, um, but a lot of times into those places where we're just different, we're just different from one another weird messages come to us that we don't have what it takes. We're different from everyone else. We're troublesome. Um, why are we weird? Why is it difficult? And actually, this is a human condition, okay? Um, most of us have had those similar feelings, you know, a little insecurity. Some people, bless y'all, who are not insecure, but um, most of us have little insecurities, you know? And um, so, those types of things influence our perceptions. And then as we launch out into the world through our early childhood development, things can begin to happen to us. And um, some of those things and uh, some of those things are what I want to talk about today. Um, so the first category I would call defensive detachment or reactive attachment issues. And sometimes those are fueled by an absent father or an emotional or emotionally detached or distracted parent, hostility, anger, scary, rejecting, ambivalence, works too much, things, anything that can create a difficulty in relating with a good father can come into play. And, and out of fear, out of reaction, we can push away. Um, what's significant is that defensive detachment often will inform sexuality. I don't like that parent or I don't like that about that parent and I will push away um, or might set myself on a path to be as different as I can possibly be from that parent or I, you know, there's so many things. I promise that I'll never be like that parent. There are other things that can create that. Um, you know, um, my, my great friend Linda, with permission, I'm sharing this. Right before she was born, her little brother, just older than her, was tragically killed. And Linda was still uh, in the womb. And this tragedy produced such anguish for her parents. Her, her mom was just distressed. Uh, investigations happened because we do investigate things when children are killed. And, 
Um, investigations happened. Mom was in so much distress and Linda was born premature, significantly premature, um, back in 1959. And that reality uh, brought separation between Linda and her mom. And even though Linda grew up knowing that her mom loved her, that separation was really difficult for her to, to bridge. Um, she jokes on her mom, and her mom said this, and she was so kind, but her mom laughed, but it also kind of hurt her that Linda called her Doris until a crisis happened one day, and she wasn't getting Doris to answer. And finally, she shrieked out, Mama! And it was like the bonding finally happened, you know? And, um, but that's an issue of defensive detachment, an unmet, unmet need created an issue. Um, also things can, injuries like trauma and difficulty can come in and, and the presence of a trauma in, in someone's life can create a, a stunting place in their emotional development. And it's not uncommon, right? Um, you see somebody who just seems to be stuck at, at a certain age. They, their lives, their reactions are just not, um, maybe never just quite matured. Um, and I think too that uh, people will sometimes just, you know, uh, my boss's dad was a man's man and, and, and kind of, kind of prone to some violence. He was a kind of an angry guy. And at the time, my boss, you would never recognize this about him now, but he was kind of a soft and emotional artistic guy. And uh, now he's just a, a, absolutely, he's like a lion, but um, just, he was soft and artistic and emotional. And his dad's difference, just the difference was perceived as a problem, you know? Um, and so those are all under defensive detachment. I think this would be a really good time to hear a testimony from Laura Beth Perry. Uh, Laura, can you can you share with us now? Sure, um, I can relate to a lot of what you said. Um, my mom had a miscarriage uh, about three months before I was conceived. It was her second miscarriage. Um, they were both boys, and I had an older brother that was alive, and then two the boys that were miscarried. And very early in life, I think um, mom was still grieving those two little boys. I think she had much more attachment to my brother. Um, a lot of times I didn't feel like she wanted me around. There was a big personality difference anyway, and I was very close to my dad. And so it was always like, just go away, leave me alone, uh, get off me, I'm tired. You know, and that was the way I was treated a lot. And then she would treat my brother very, very differently. She was so excited when he would come around. And even giving her hugs and things like that, a lot of times I was kind of shrugged off, um, but she would welcome his hugs. And I began to believe, rather than understanding the grief that mom was going through and so longing for those two little boys that had died, um, I began to believe that mom just loved boys better than girls. And maybe if I'd been a boy, mom would have loved me more. And, um, you know, as a child, I just couldn't understand that. And so I began to act more like my brother. Um, and the more that I began to act like my brother, I think mom pushed me away even more. The girls at school began to push me away even more. And I was always labeled uh, tomboy. And I hated that label because I knew that I wasn't a boy, even though I, I, there was part of me that wanted to be a boy, but, and I was acting like a boy, but there was a part of me that desperately wanted to be one of the girls. And I would try to fit in, but I never felt like I fit in and I was pushed away. And so there was this internal conflict um, and then I was also, um, I remember as a child hearing the term, the black sheep of the family. And I don't think anybody in my family told me that's who I was, but I remember internalizing that and going, that's me. I'm the black sheep. You know, it's like, I just assumed there was one in every family. And since I was the one always in trouble, I was the youngest. <laughs> um, I, I just assumed that was me. And I felt like I didn't belong. I remember at one point really feeling like I was adopted. And I was very convinced of that until I realized that I was just like my dad. And I looked just like him and I thought, well, clearly I'm my dad's daughter. Um, but there was just, a, I think, an attachment really from my mom and my sister both. And, um, and then I was molested when I was eight years old. And so with all this internal 
turmoil and all this confusion, now there's a layer of sexuality on top of that. And I began experimenting in, um, with my friends. And so all these broken relationships that I already have and not relating well to girls and trying to act so much like a boy, um, things were just getting worse and worse. I wasn't making friends well. And um, that just began to continue throughout childhood. And in the high school, I had um, was trying so hard to, to find love. Dad was working a lot now. We weren't near as close as when I was a child. So I was trying to find that love that I'd really only gotten from my dad growing up, that close relating. And so I was dating anybody and everybody that would show me any time of day. I was sleeping with every guy I could find. Um, and it was just becoming more and more and more broken. And I was so miserable and I felt like this used piece of trash that no one wanted. Um, eventually it got so bad that um, I, well, I was extremely addicted to pornography and it was just fueling the bad relating and eventually I became almost like a prostitute without even getting paid for it. Um, just meeting random men online, trying so desperately to be loved and to have that relationship again like I'd had a ch as a child with my father. Um, but in the meantime, hating being a girl more and more and more and just really rejecting the feminine side. I didn't want to be anything like my mother. I really related um, when you said that too, I, I just, I wanted nothing to do with my mother or to be anything like her. Um, so I spent almost um, nine years living as transgender. I went down the whole road. I embraced it totally. And at that time, I thought that's really who I was. I believed with all my heart I was born that way and I'd always been that way. I didn't see any kind of causality. I would have told you that's who I was. Um, and I had all the legal changes. I had two major surgeries, all the hormones. I had a beard and all these things. and I realized tragically several years into it that it wasn't biologically possible to transition. No matter what I did to my body, I was still a girl. And I realized that it was just that I didn't want to be a girl. And there was so much pain there. And I thought, well, this is the best it's ever gonna get. I'm not going to be a girl. So I'm just going to stay stuck like this. And I'm just gonna let the world think that I'm a man. And so I thought I was happy because it was better than the pain I'd experienced before. But Jesus sort of interrupted my life. <laughs> uh, he began to draw me back, and I was just radically saved and set free. And I thought I could be a man of God. But the Lord began to heal, or well, He began to draw that out of me and began to convict me of who I was. And I'll never forget one time, as I was picturing standing before Him, He said, If you stood before me tonight, what name would I call? And I thought, Wait, wait a minute. Uh, what do you mean? Like, uh, you know, I've changed now. There, I realize this wasn't your will, but what am I supposed to do about it now? You know, I'm kind of stuck this way. And uh, he reminded me of John chapter one, where it says, Jesus Christ himself is the creator. And he said, you cannot claim to love me and yet reject my creation. But in the most loving voice I've ever heard in all my life, he whispered to me and he said, let me tell you who you are. And that's what began to free me. And I realized that I was created with an identity, with a plan and a purpose. And he has radically set me free of all that. I have no desire to go back. And I am now have fully embraced being feminine and uh, love being a girl. How, how long did you live a transgendered life? Uh, it was almost nine years. How long did it take you to transition in? Uh, probably a couple of years. It, it took several years, a lot longer than I wanted for the facial hair to grow in. That was always um, frustrating. The voice started to change really within the first couple of months. And it was much lower then than it is now. By the grace yeah. of God. <laughs> yeah. And um, what, once the Lord began to work to set you free, was, was that just a decision and boom, you were done? Or No. I, I kind of thought it was at the time because... Um, you know, I, I wasn't sure actually what happened when the Lord called me out of that. Um, it was the hardest decision I've ever made. I, I remember I felt like I was in this pit that I couldn't get out of. And he, I had this clear vision of him getting down on one knee and he reached his hand down into the pit and he said, do you trust me? And I knew he was asking me to walk away from everything. And I didn't know, I honestly thought I would be miserable the rest of my life, but I thought, I want to serve Jesus with all my heart and I'm willing to do it at any cost. 
And so I said, okay. And I took his hand and walked away from everything. And then a few days later, I showed up at my mom's Bible study. And that's a whole, story, a whole nother story. But these women had been praying for me for years. And when I showed up, they began to embrace me and hug me and just love me as one of the women. And they were so excited that I'd come home and they just embraced me with so much love. And the transgender lie just broke. And I thought, you know, praise God, like I'm so free of this and I've been totally healed and totally set free. And, um, but then I didn't realize the layers of brokenness there still were. But as I began to forgive my mother, as um, the Lord began to sort of peel away the layers of the onion and bring up these areas that I was still really broken and just begin to repent of things, um, to ask forgiveness, to forgive. Um, as I began to do that, the Lord began to heal me just little by little. So it's been quite a journey over the last three or four years. That's beautiful. Thank you for okay. sharing with us. Um, I just made a spontaneous decision to go ahead and share Joseph's story. He, he programmed or recorded this for us separately. I was listening to it earlier and I just, I'm so proud of this man. He's such a strong encourager, such a faithful man. Um, but his, his story is surprising. So I want to share it with you. Before I was school aged, my father expressed the word stupid in disgust over something that failed to work to his benefit. Seeing an opportunity, Satan caused this word to pierce into my heart. I then took on an identity that was never meant to be. Any time work with dad went poorly, I felt the sting of the words, you're stupid, ringing about in my mind. I grew angrier with my father. In fact, I hated him. Birth order, age gaps, and where my siblings went to school contributed to how little I got to know them growing up. Being tall and thin, I was affectionately nicknamed String Bean. The brother I was around most teased me for not being physically strong enough to tighten or loosen nuts on farm implements. While I hated men and authorities who were similar to my dad, I admired other men exhibiting physical strength, confidence, and compassion. Finding pornography around the age of 10 moved that admiration from envy into lust, and then into addictive behaviors of self-loathing, isolation, and masturbation. My identity as a boy among boys was on weak ground and I longed for healing to ease this pain and wrongly tried to ease it by looking at homosexual porn. Fast forward to January 2010, before which I had turned 40 and gained health insurance, I decided to get a complete medical checkup. In that and subsequent meetings, I learned about why my confidence was low and why I didn't have physical strength like my male peers. Although my body had physical signs of having a disorder, a genetic test revealed it clearly. Men's sex chromosomes are XY and women's are XX, but mine are XXY. Already weak in my masculine identity, I didn't find the news very helpful. How would I accept being an intersex person, much less a eunuch? While our physical bodies are distinctly male, this condition plays with the mind and suggests otherwise. Among one out of 500 men who have this condition, our bodies produce little, if any, testosterone. Testosterone contributes to physical strength, stamina, confidence, and a sense of well-being. This startling news definitely shook up how I viewed myself. At first, I threw an adult tantrum and dove into familiar addictions of pornography and isolation. But there's one thing I've learned along the way. Talking about my pain is the sure way to get out from under its power. But it doesn't stop there. I had to make an adult decision to agree with God's goodness toward me. Both of these require humility, and humility is required to get God's help for anything. In humility, I chose to forgive my dad and laid aside my offenses toward him. In humility, I confessed that I coveted and idolized the strength of men. In humility, I made changes to restrict my addictive on-ramps. In my cries for mercy, God has met me in numerous ways. His healing love untangled and healed places of wounding and regret. 
the pain that took me to addictive behavior began to lose its power. The once weakened sense of identity that came from misunderstood anger and from fallen creation is being built into a more confident one, not a false macho based on me trying to prove anything to anyone, but one that God has graciously brought forth in love. What is true about me is that I am created male by God. I am a conduit of God's tender, powerful, and affirming grace for both myself and for others in the body of Christ. I still need God's help to walk out my male gender according to His ways while building up my emotions and abilities according to His will for my life. And I need God's grace to deny false idols of masculinity, confidence, and strength. Therefore, I will choose to delight in being fearfully and wonderfully made in His image. While I still find myself attracted to my same sex, I am not a homosexual. I am made in God's image and I was created for pure relationships with men and with women. Thank you. Which is a pretty amazing testimony. Um, the, the recognition of homosexual confusion for him uh, began to have an explanation. He could, he could see where the injury had come in and set him on a trajectory of uh, self-comfort through pornography and things that reinforced the fears, the insecurities, the lusts, the temptations. Laura's testimony uh, gave us some similar things because of pain, because of rejection and perceptions of who she was, it altered the course that she was on. It altered her course and set her in a direction of rejecting the good of the feminine that, uh, that she is, actually. And she, isn't she a beautiful testimony of what that is? It's important to see stories like that because it's not, it's not really hearsay any more than anyone else's story is a hearsay. But in fact, I think you need to hear that people could see that there were things that broke in, that invited, made, made them receptive to the temptation of the evil one. And as God began to unpack and unfold some of those things that they had believed, some of those things that had altered their course, they were actually able to apply truth to that and begin to find places of freedom. So I just wanted you to hear that uh, for a moment that as we dive back into the material. Um, I'll direct you to your, your notes where it says lack of good role models. Um, for, for men in the pursuit of per, um, creating homosexual desire, sometimes there's an overly strong feminizing influence for the sake of men and an overly strong masculine influence for women. So if you couple either of those strong influences from the opposite gender, and you put it up against defensive detachment where I'm already detached from my own gender and now something strong is drawing me in a new direction. Um, so often you will see, of course, this is not in every case, but for many who struggle homosexually, for many, who, um, who struggle with gender confusion in general, they will see underneath it that they've been drawn in a direction. Um, for, for me, I came out, out of homosexuality as well. I lived a lesbian life um, from 13 to 29. And the, in, in that reality, I, I began to be formed um, by the idea that I, I never would have what it took to be a good woman. I would never have what it took to find my place among women. They, they quit being my peers and I began to be peer influenced pri primarily by men. Um, my husband, for my husband, that's a real bonus. Uh, I really, really, really like cars and electronics <laughs> and uh, yard work and things like that. So we're, we're great together, but um, but in fact, I, I came really late to the game to understand where I fit with my own gender. 
And when the Lord began to do it, it was kind of amazing. It was like this, uh, this whole world opened up for me in the middle of my emerging healing, the things that God was doing to set me free. It was kind of amazing. This whole world opened up to me and um, I am most blessed to have some amazing women in my world uh, to call friends, um, people who have helped me with this. Um, I think uh, we have to consider what we, we call it mother wound. We got that from um, a woman named Leanne Payne who talks about um, really the brokenness, the broken feminine and how it affects male homosexuality. The idea of a dominant mother, um, sometimes those mothers have husband their children, girlfriend their, their young sons, uh, and that for many of the young men, that really amounted to emotional incest. It was, it's been very difficult for those men to find real, real freedom because they feel overly drawn by mothers who really love them. Their mothers really do love them, but it, it has hindered their ability to grow. It's, a, it's hindered their ability to, to grow in the masculine. And uh, it's, it's a significant factor for most male homosexuality. Um, where, where it's not really about blaming mother, it isn't about blaming mother. But you'll see underneath that for many, for many men, issues of manipulation and control, um, internalizing the gender bashing. Maybe they're unhappy with their husband or unhappy with their own childhood sexual traumas. Um, the fact of broken, broken marriages, sometimes the presence of lesbianism in the mom can be real strong factors in influencing young men. Uh, for lesbians, uh, people in my background, things like family dynamics and understanding the mother-daughter, father-daughter um, messages that I would get. Um, and a unique factor for me was my mother um, became very ill when I was young and her illness uh, influenced her emotions. It influenced her physical body. It influenced her family. Uh, fear kind of came into that place. I began to identify my mom with powerlessness. I began to identify that with emotional instability. She, was a, she actually really was a great mother, but my perceptions were really altered by fear. Um, and, and so I, I actually over-identified with my father. He was a more secure place for me. Uh, that that isn't a criticism of either one. I mean, I think sometimes our parents in our own histories, right? We can find places where our parents uh, were obviously not perfect. And as parents, you'll know you weren't. Um, this doesn't cause it. It's an influence that comes into play with temperaments and perceptions that are already there. Um, other things to consider too are things like um, peer pressure and judgments and inner vows. Laura, Laura Beth talked about inner vows. She used a different phrase, but just that place where you, you look and you say, I'll never be that. I don't like that. I don't like that, how that feels. And I'm not going to be that kind of woman. I'm not going to do it. You know, um, Joseph, you know, took in, took in the false idea of being stupid, uh, being less, not meeting up as a male. So those types of things get internalized and, and uh, are hard to overcome because they're hard to see. You know, once they're in there, they're in there. And it takes a, the Lord to deliver us. Things like, um, for women, things like uh, gender rejection, um, fleeing from mother. Um, I was very influenced in my college years from feminism and feministic ideology. So it's made it very, very hard for me to like and respect um, softness or tenderness in my own heart or the fact that I, I am actually really nurturing. And um, feminism and feminist ideologies kind of shamed that in me. Uh, it made it hard for me to, to accept my own gender or my own inclinations as a woman. Um, judgments about ourselves for women often a judgment of not being significant, not being able to meet up, 
creates internal confusion. Um, and also for many, many women that I minister to, not so much for myself, but sometimes we see things like negative and harmful experiences with males. And a lot of times in your clinics, you would see, uh, you know, girls coupling up and coming in, um, trying to make an adequate relationship. And you'll see underneath there, I'll, I will never treat a girl the way my dad treated me. I, I'm, I'll be a better husband to her than, than um, a man ever would be. Um, I, I'll be more roman romantic. I'll be more intentional. You'll, you'll hear it. I mean, right? Um, so we, we watch those things unfold and we go, these, these are the tender places in people's hearts. You know, these, these are formed on a, on a foundation that is pretty old for most people. And um, that's why it takes so much prayer. Uh, emotional dependency is something else too. I think a lot of times we just, um, uh, men and women can find themselves overly attached, trying to draw their very life out of another person. You know, I'm drawing my life out of you, my security out of you, and I now I'm entirely dependent on you for my well-being. Um, you know, it's it's a normal occurrence when you're eight to thirteen, but if you don't outgrow those things, then then they become formational. Um, you know, there's no healthy personal boundaries that. We've lost the ability to be emotionally close without being sexual as well. Another factor we have to look at is sexual distortion and sexual abuse. Uh, Joseph talked about pornography and exhibitionism. Uh, Laura didn't testify to that today, but, but pornography was a factor for her. Uh, it was a factor for me. I don't think it's uncommon at all. Um, what happens is that we, we, our minds and our emotions uh, and our, even our ability to see become uh, altered by having a diet of that type of material. Um, it's interesting too, um, regarding pornography, you know, 70% of churchmen are using pornography on a daily basis. That's the, that's the statistic, and it, that's a huge amount. What's, what's shocking is in the past 15 to 20 years, I, I find most women dealing, most of the women I deal with also dealing with pornography, which I, it was unique when I was coming around, but not so unique anymore. Um, you know, just binge watch a few Netflix shows and you've had a, a full, you've had a full exposure to sexuality, human sexuality. Um, other, other things that bring sexual distortion are things like verbal seduction, emotional distortion. Um, people throw a word around the word narcissism a lot lately, but it's certainly a factor in these things. Um, many men and women have uh, sexual abuse at the foundation of much of what they've uh, become, things like incest and rape and abuse and molestation uh, is prevalent. Um, our, our current statistic, this is just a few years old, we, out of, we did a survey within our ministry of all the folders, that all the intake folders that we had ever done. And, um, and then Within it, we began to ask people to respond, just giving us an idea of where they are in their journey, you know, where they benefited, um, you know, what did they gain, uh, what did they learn. But in there, we, we also grabbed a, a statistic. We asked, we asked a statistical question. We wanted to know how many of the people who said homosexuality was a root issue that brought them to First Stone Ministries, we asked, how, were you sexually abused and when? And more than 65% of the men and 80% of the women were sexually abused. And that is a strong, that is a thumping strong statistic that says that there's, a, there's something behind it 
that produces an injury. Um, and in, it, as we're pastoral caregivers, it's really significant because people will deny that those things happened. Um, you know, they, they'll, they'll minimize childhood experiences. They'll pass it off as play. And you know what? For some, those experiences were play and they don't seem to have a long-term effect on, on their view of themselves. But you know what? For many, it was a traumatizing experience. It was violating. And uh, we too quickly excuse it and say, kids will be kids, boys will be boys. It, things, things happen. But in fact, that's part of what needs tender care in people's souls. And then I just uh, will touch also on environmental factors, things that uh, alter uh, personality and temperament, things like trauma, no touch or care. Um, we have a, you know, it's a pretty strong um, factor for many, many adopted people. Um, the, that, that early separation from parents can become a real factor in not being gender secure not being secure sexually. Ideas like rejection and identity conflicts and self-acceptance and deep-rooted rejection and ridicule and doubt and fear, identity conflicts, self-acceptance, temperaments in general. Um, I personally, uh, one of the real conflicts in my life is that I, I am wired with really high ideals and a really laid back temperament. And um, it, it can make me uh, real easy going. I, patience is easy for me. It, you know, I don't have to work at being patient. I can be very patient until, until my lines are crossed. And then I, I'm done, I retaliate. It, it becomes an issue. Well, into that problem, is, uh, you know, for me being so laid back, my mom's persistent need for many years, many, many years, taxed my patience, my flexibility, my, my willingness to serve or do what I was asked, or even my ability to, to take hard things that were said to me just because she was so, she was so frustrated. I can't imagine living 40 years with, uh, with a disability. But Sometimes she would lash out at me and I was a safe one because I, I didn't retaliate. And, um, but you know, it altered, it altered my view of myself. I, I carried around a, a deep shame, um, kind of a perpetually demeaned point of view. And, you know, she wasn't really always a name caller, but she, she could sure uh, cuss me to the other side of the road sometimes. And in that, in that reality for me, it, it, I just didn't know that I was built for strength. I didn't know that I had the ability to stand up against difficult things. Um, I think many too, uh, when we talk about, you know, the definition of what it is to be a man or what it is to be a woman, people struggle with those cultural or, or even traditional definitions of male and female. And what I would say is those cultural definitions don't matter nearly as much as whether I'm at ease with who I am as a woman, as a gendered being with the expression the way I am. If I can be at ease with the fact that I'm the girl that likes cars and tools, you know, if I can be at ease with that, then the full expression of my feminine soul can be brought out. You know, I'm not... I'm not a girly girl. Um, you know, I'm not the, the one that everybody points to as this be that girl, you know. But, but actually being at ease with, with my own characteristics also makes, makes me go through experiences of people admiring who I am. You know, I'm at ease because of Jesus's faithfulness to me and his healing. And I kind of like how I express differently than some of my some of my great friends. Uh, I'm never going to be the one that likes that likes shopping, but you know, Laura, Laura Beth will. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, 
The final category I want to point to is what, what peer pressure will do. And um, this, this is off of the grid of what our daily experience is with people. But in fact, um, gang activity, prison life, social pressures and fads can produce um, changes in perceptions and sexuality. Um, there is a trend happening right now called, and my, Laura, correct me if I get this wrong, sudden onset gender, and what is it? Dysphoria. So sudden onset gender dysphoria. And here in this cultural trend of transgenderism and the pressures that kids are really receiving to try on identities, uh, there is, there's a rash of uh, particularly young women, but lots of young men too, who are coming out as trans. Uh, so I'm really, I'm really a boy uh, in a girl's body. And it, it's, it, the reason they're saying rapid onset or sudden onset, the reason they're saying that is because, you know, a few short weeks ago, things seemed fine, you know? And um, so we're, we're looking for solutions that bring about change. So, uh, so let me just pick up another couple of topics for you just to edify you. Um, one of the concerns that I have, and I think it's a real motivator in saying yes to doing this workshop, uh, is that I don't, I, I don't want the church church men and church women to be intimidated uh, inside of that cultural conversation. The, the fact is that the, the same motivators toward why we fight for life, we fight for life across the board. And we do that because um, God, put, God put in here the knowledge that life is, is him. That's from him. Fruitfulness is attached to life. The fact that babies are conceived and born is a witness to the, to, to life. It's a, it's a witness to his best design. But, but the push regarding what is compassion, uh, we are often being told what compassion is. Um, one way to look at it is if, um, if we change our definition to compassion, of compassion to mean, whatever you want to do is fine. Inside of ourselves, we will, we will feel the conflict uh, of, of, um, encroaching deception. We'll feel it. We'll feel the pushback. There's some, there's a witness in us for a while that, that everything is not fine. Whatever you want to do isn't okay. Um, and we need to have that conversation because when God talks to us about our sexuality, he has his purposes in mind. And you can't really preach his purposes to somebody who's in deception. You can witness to them, you can testify about it, you can point to it, but what's important to us as men and women who are ministering or working alongside people who are confused themselves is if we know that his purposes are for redemption and for transformation, we won't be easily shaken by what, whatever's being said in front of us. What it will do, it will prompt prayer in us. It'll, it'll say, I need to know more what the word of God says. I need to know what the hope is. I need to have close at hand what the hope is, not what the sin is, although we, we need to know that God calls things sin. So um, if, if you will permit me, I'm going to go to Ephesians chapter 5. And... Uh, This will be the only passage that I will do, but you'll see in your notes, if you've opened your notes already, um, you'll see that uh, I have for you many, many, many verses. 
um, that just talk about sexual sin and brokenness. Um, I ask that you forgive me. Uh, I'm currently reading in the New Living Translation, and I was really surprised uh, myself that, you know, I'm a, I'm a girl that does word studies, digs into the meeting, tries to dig into understanding. And something that's surprising to me is that the New Living Translation has done a really good job. <laughs> um, so for all of us who are traditionalists, um, I'm breaking my own tradition today. So Ephesians 5, verse 1. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear, dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. Let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. Obscene stories, foolish talk, coarse jokes, these are not for you. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. You can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God. For a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. He says, you can be sure that they will not enter the kingdom of God. Don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins, for the anger of God will fall upon all who disobey him. Don't participate in the things that these people do. For once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light. For this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. It is shameful even to talk about the things that ungodly do ungodly people do in secret, but their evil intentions will be exposed when the light shines on them, for light makes everything visible. And the reason that that sticks out to me is that um, just like in other places, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, for example, after it goes through a whole list of things, bad things that people do, it, it turns and says, and such were some of you, but you have been washed, you have been cleansed, right? He's, he's pointing to identity. In this one, he says, no immorality, impurity, sensuality is part of God's people. You used to be darkness, but now you're light. Walk as people of light. Every time the scriptures do that, I'm, I'm encouraged. They're in order to really be effective witnesses anyway, we have to be really centered on, hey, what did Jesus save me from? You know? Uh, my, I have a friend named Mike who has this saying, and I just love it. I love to quote it. He says, Jesus did not have to hang on the cross one minute more for me than he did for you. And he was pointing to his own sexual sin and brokenness. It's like, what is our gospel hope? When we're really centered in that, we are not easily shaken. So just uh, in closing, I want to tell you, if you want to find out more about Laura Beth Perry's testimony, um, I have a link in here for you, but her ministry she works for First Stone Ministries, but her ministry is called From Transgender to Transformed, right? <laughs> and uh, uh, the website, you, you can type that out almost exactly and get to her website. Um, and no problem, just transgender to transformed. Transgender to transformed.com. Yeah. Okay. And uh, you'll, you'll find some you'll find some great stories. You'll find some great statistics. You'll, you'll see her former self, um, that she, she's very 
uh, involved in the cultural conversation. And um, at our at our website, firststone.org, F-I-R-S-T-S-T-O-N-E.org, you'll find so many articles, so many beautiful resources, lots of video testimony if you're curious. And um, and then with, with this, I'm going to include also for you a link to a Dropbox, and I'm putting a few things in there for you. So if you, if you just click through um, into that Dropbox, you will see a few articles that I think would be helpful to you, another set of the teaching notes, and, um, and some other things. So thanks for letting me share with you. I look forward to the Q&A day. Bye-bye.